Uh, welcome to our second series of virtual readings from the climate fiction anthology, Our Entangled Future, Stories to Empower Quantum Social Change. My name is Leonie Goodwin and I work at Sea Change, a values-based organisation bridging research and practice around transformations to sustainability. Uh, we're delighted to, um, to welcome you today uh, to the readings, but before we get started, just a few practical things. Uh, could everyone please make sure to mute themselves when they're not talking? And um, we'll be turning off the chat function um, during the readings and we'll open it up again when we get to the discussion. So you can then post questions and reflections in the chat um, after the readings. You can also use the raise hands function uh, when we ask, uh, when we invite questions or reflections from the audience. And just to let you know, the webinar today, the, the reading today is being recorded and a link will be sent out after the call. So um, I'm now going to hand over to Karen O'Brien. Uh, Karen's one of the co-editors of Our Entangled Future. She's a professor of human geography at the University of Oslo and co-founder of Sea Change. And she's going to introduce us to the Our Entangled Future project and reveal why, why she and co-authors, co-editors Anne Elkori, Nicole Schaffernacker and Jordan Rosenfeld embarked on this project through the Adaptation Connects project she coordinates at the University of Oslo. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, thank you, Leonie. And thanks everybody for joining us for this second webinar. Um, it's a two-part webinar series that is presenting the short stories from Our Entangled Future, Stories to Empower Quantum Social Change. And last week we had five readings from authors and a really rich exchange about um, the idea of writing stories that are empowering and agency-based. And the four authors who are here with us today are gonna also be sharing excerpts from their story, reading them to us. And we really hope that you'll be inspired to read more of the stories. And we'll follow this with a facilitated discussion and some questions and a little exercise. So have a pen and paper ready. Um, but before I start, I wanted to just give a little bit of background. As Leonie said, um, this is part, the, um, Our Entangled Future was part of a research project called Adaptation Connects, which stands for combining old and new knowledge to enable conscious transformations to sustainability. And in this project, we're looking at not just like adapting to climate change, but adapting to the very idea that we are changing, we are transforming the global environment and that we can actually transform it in a different way. So this project is looking at the conditions for transformative change, such as creativity, collaboration, empowerment, and also the flexibility of narratives. And um, Anne, Nicole, and I share a, a really like keen interest in this idea of quantum social change and what alternative paradigms have to offer us in terms of understanding social change from a nonlinear, non-local perspective. And um, we were just kind of talking about, oh, wouldn't that be fun to just put out a call for short stories that, you know, that haven't been written, that aren't this dystopian, you know, this is what climate the future will look like, but that actually open up our ways of thinking and seeing the future. And um, someone just sent me a, um, a, a quote from da an environmentalist David Suzuki that says, the way that we see the world shapes the way we treat it. If a mountain is a deity, not a pile of ore, if a forest is a sacred grove, not timber, if other species are biological kin, not resources, or if the planet is our mother, not an opportunity, then we will treat each other with greater respect. Thus, thus is the challenge to look at the world from a different perspective. And I think that putting out the call for these short stories really opened up to present so many different ways of seeing our role in our entangled future and to really think about these not yet here realities and what they could be with Quantum concepts such as entanglement, superposition, potentiality, uncertainty, quantum leaps, all of these things, you know, driving us to think differently about how we relate to each other, how we relate to nature, and not the least, how we relate to future. So when we put out the call for short stories in 2018, we thought, you know, we didn't have any idea about how many stories we would get. And, um, and we were so pleased to see um, that, that we receive really wonderful and inspiring stories from writers, from researchers, from you know, people who are thinking differently about the way we approach the, the future. So we selected um, 
um, nine stories and we had a, a jury um, assess them and worked on a writing process. And we launched the, um, the book in 2019 at the Transformations Conference in Santiago, Chile. And, um, and so I think it's just a really exciting time now to revisit these stories, hear from the authors exactly you know, what drove them, what inspired them, and also just hear, hear them reading from the beautiful collection. And um, the book is available as a free download and we'll be putting the link in there. So we encourage you um, to um, engage with these and think of your own short stories to inspire quantum social change. So with that, I will pass it to Nicole. No, to Anne. To me. <laughs> to you. Okay, to Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, okay, so I, I also want to thank you all for uh, taking the time to be with us here today and to um, share these ideas. Um, we've got an incredibly talented lineup of writers that I'm thrilled to be introducing. And as Karen mentioned, our contributors to our entangled future span the globe. And for this series number two, we are joined by Catherine Sarah Young in Australia, uh, Cass Otter Leaf in Germany, Albert van uh, Wijnagarden in Holland, and Julia del Carmen um, Sanchez Henkel in Norway. Um, so these writers bring a wealth of experience to their writing and draw from their work as accomplished academics, artists, activists, community builders, and more. And um, before we launch into their stories, we also just wanna take this moment to share some of the artwork that was included in our Entangled Future. And um, we ended up pairing a, a artwork with each individual story. And it was a way for us to, to sort of lift the piece and bring a different dimension of expression to quantum social change. And to me, these images highlight the ways that we're already sort of engaging in an entangled way with our, our world every day. <laughs> so I just want to take a moment to, um, to share some of this work and just acknowledge the work of our artists before we, we jump into the, the reading here. So this first one um, we featured in our introduction to the, to the book, and it's called I Wanted to Stay in That Place, Whatever It Is by Ellen Glarum Hogland. And Ellen um, traditionally works with um, a really unique method of um, handcrafting her own natural pigments and dyes in the places that she um, creates artwork. She does a lot of traveling. Um, but when I was talking with her about this piece, she let me know that she actually just took it while she was walking home one day and uh, saw the sky perfectly reflected in the river underneath her on a bridge that she was crossing. So I just, I really loved just sort of that creative impulse to just stop and appreciate the, the moment <laughs> wherever you are. So it's got a, a really sort of enchanted feel to it to me. Um, we have a piece by Catherine Sarah Young, who is also one of our authors. So she's an interdisciplinary artist. And um, this is a, a piece of artwork that accompanies her story. And she actually designed um, individual perfumes based on scents that um, come that are natural to the Philippines. And I believe she started this project or a layer of this project was created during her time as an artist in residence in um, the Mind Museum in Manila. So we're very excited to, to hear her reading soon. Um, this work uh, accompanies Cass Otterleaf's um, story Synergy, and it's actually a collaborative artwork piece by Kristen um, Bjornerud and Eric Gerzano. And the way that they work on their projects is they um, purposely leave an image incomplete for the other artist to fill in. So I believe Kristen worked on the, um, the flowers and Eric worked on the bird. Um, so they, they sort of do these imaginative pairings of putting this work out there and not knowing how the other artist will complete the image. So they end up with these really fantastical and imaginative pieces. And um, this image was actually the only image in our anthology that was specifically created to suit the work. Um, Emma Arnold, who is also a researcher, she's a geographer and an artist, and she's very interested in the um, aesthetics and politics of climate change. Um, she uh, created a piece specifically for the green lizard by Albert. Um, and we love the way that she worked with <laughs> the tail and a bit of a, a mini infinity sign here. 
And lastly, um, for this series today, we've got an image um, from Siri Ecker Svensson's um, series, The Presence of Things Unseen. And so she works with analog photography. And for this series, she was very inspired by deep ecology and the ideas of um, all the ways that nature um, is and um, sort of the sentience of living beings and their value beyond <laughs> our sort of human um, utility or use for nature. So just appreciating the, the sentience of nature as it is. And this accompanies um, Julia's story, which is set in um, a rainforest in South America. So I'm gonna um, just pause that here for the moment um, and then we'll return to some of the images after the readings. So with that, I'm really excited to further introduce our first author, Catherine Sarah Young. Uh, Catherine is a Chinese Filipina interdisciplinary artist, designer, and writer who creates work that in investigates the tensions between nature and technology. She is trained in molecular biology, contemporary art, and interactive design, and she has several bodies of work that investigate climate change. And Catherine will be reading from her short story, The Ephemeral Marbles Perfume Store. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Nicole. Hello, everyone. Um, really good to see you all today. Um, my name is Catherine, you can call me Cap, and I'm going to be reading my story at the Ephemeral Marbles Perfume Store. A little brown mouse hopped out of the boat and had just anchored itself to the dock. Quietly, it skittered between the other boats whose owners had already retired for the night. Some new ones were brightly painted, while others showed decades of wear. The city was quiet and the moon glowed brightly. The seas had risen long ago and had kept rising until finally they leveled off. The world's giant leaking faucet had been sealed. Many families who had been living on large rafts formed a new marine colony. Years passed and floating cities dominated the waters, houses connected by sea bridges that served as a foundation for the city. The bridges held them all together in a network with roads that allowed them to easily go from one building to the next. The city of Arana was anchored to the new seabed, the land where their great grandfathers used to plant crops. Now it served to hold the city together and keep it from floating away. The mouse ran along a bridge that angled sharply to the left and onto another group of floating houses. This was the merchant district. The little mouse passed buildings where people sold fish, sea vegetables, and air-grown plants and flowers before running straight into a dull-looking wooden structure at the edge of the city. Near the windows were bottles made of colored glass and filled with translucent liquid, which gave an interesting contrast to the building's gray color. The mouse paused behind a shelf and fell asleep. Our little mouse had entered the residence and workshop of the city's perfumer. The shop was plain compared to the others, which were decorated with large colorful geometric shapes. The walls were made of exposed wood and brick. Small, beautifully shaped glass bottles decorated the wall display. Above the door hung a large sign, the Ephemeral Marbles Perfume Store. Amelia, the city's perfumer, was a simple and direct woman who poured all of her energies into the perfumes she was making. She was precise, quick-minded, and sensitive to the smallest changes in weather. She was also an insomniac, and tonight she was the only one in the city who was still awake. She sat at a long mahogany table at the far end with large distillation flasks, a metal weighing scale, measuring tools, and other equipment set out neatly before her. One could smell roses that shifted to hints of saffron, jasmine, and eucalyptus when moving from one end of the table to the other. A nearby shelf held large amber jars full of different essential oils. 
The shop was dark, except for the desk lamp casting a bright yellow glow on the glassware. Amelia was carefully mixing a simple perfume for an important client. That's it, one more drop, she thought. As the mouse came in, the floor creaked and Amelia sat upright. She removed her glasses and rubbed her eyes. She had been working on this perfume for 10 days now and finally it was done. It was time to stop and get some much needed rest. She carefully decanted the perfume into an emerald bottle and placed it in the box that the client would pick up tomorrow. Her fingers traced the amber jars, sealing them before standing up to place them back onto the shelf. Silently, she went upstairs to her bedroom and was soon sound asleep. At the other end of the perfumery, the cat cautiously licked the spider webs growing on the alchemy jars, tasting the missing spider's last meals and the particles brought in by the winds from storms past. Sensing the cat, the sleeping mouse jerked awake and ran for its life away from the perfumer's shop. Thank you. Well done. Thank you so much, Catherine. <laughs> Um, I really love hearing it this time around how uh, how active the animals are in the telling of the story too, and the different the cat licking the spider webs and yeah that's wonderful <laughs> that's great um, yeah and I just want to say we really loved your story for its ways of intertwining um, scent and smell um, and how these senses carry our relationship to place and to our personal histories and identities so thank you for drawing that out and excited to talk more about it in the panel. <laughs> Okay, so I would like to um, to turn it over to Kess Otter Leaf in just a moment. Um, so Kess is a working trans woman and author of two speculative fiction novels, uh, a grassroots community organizer for over two decades. She has worked and organized around the world with a particular focus on the intersection of gender, queerness, and environmental struggles. And Kess is joining us from Berlin, and she'll be reading from her story Synergy whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Um, I wasn't nervous, now I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, yeah, how do you follow a story like that? Kat, I love your story so much, it's so gorgeous. Um, oh, I forgot about the spider webs as well. I was like, yes. Um, yeah, well, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Um, yeah, I'll read my story, I'll stop talking. I'm really nervous. <laughs> <clears throat> Fog blanketed the heath, and the early morning held its breath. There was no wind, not even the smallest of breezes, and the air hanging over the boggy earth was thick with anticipation. Two teal ducks appeared out of the wall of white and landed loudly on a pond. They called to each other between mouthfuls of pondweed, a gentle sound that bubbled out of their chests, almost stolen by the heavy air. They could only just make out the shape of their friend on the water, but calling, they stayed connected. The marshland had everything they needed, but today they were on edge, turning constantly on the cold water to keep watch. Their home was full of the stench of danger. A predator passed by in the night, maybe a whole pack, and the scent of them lay in lines across the land. The water wasn't deep enough to keep the teal safe and they both knew it. From the edge of the forest, a snatch of a cry reached their ears, a bear searching for her cub. Early dragonflies buzzed from pond to pond, and the air resonated with the chuck chuck of the first stone chap, taking his place on a branch of heather. No one could know that in a thousand years, this would all be concrete, parliaments, motorways, and plastic bags. The ducks had eaten their fill and, still calling to each other, they took off from the pond and flew out into the fog. The sky was lighter now and their day was just beginning. Brussels, from the old Dutch for home on the marsh. The peregrine twisted, banked left towards sunrise, dropped down into the street. Another humid morning. 
If it stormed again, she would need to stay home and the pigeons would be hiding too. Each day she carried the heavy bodies of birds to the nest and each day her chick remained unsatisfied. But she knew her hunting grounds like she knew the fluff on her young one's face. She made a loop around the tower of a decaying church and out into an avenue. A tram line ran a hundred meters below a brook of rusty metal that led down and into the, into the park. She went high again to take in her territory. Even on a morning as burning hot as this one was sure to be, this was the perfect place to hunt. Acres of green grassland for the starlings to roam. The few poplars left and felled were filled with the squawks of ring-necked parakeets. And squatting luxury towers of apartment buildings, there were enough pigeons to feed all the hungry peregrine chicks in the city. When she was young, this had all been a construction site that seemed like it would never end. Squares of concrete connected by curving lines of cars, stinking trucks and screaming motorbikes. Even the pigeons had tasted like smog back then. But something had changed. And now things were quiet. Roads replaced by gardens, construction by reclamation. She swerved over a line of fruit trees tended by a small group of humans. She couldn't be less interested in fruit or humans, but the trees attracted the food birds and the food birds kept her chick quiet, at least for a while. She hovered for a moment and selected her prey, a male wood pigeon courting a female, flapping around, oblivious to her watchful presence in the sky. As the humans walked away with their baskets full, she pulled back her wings, narrowed her eyes and began her dive. <clears throat> There's the falcon again, the third time that week she'd watched her hunting over the gardens. Beautiful, isn't she? Her friend appeared from behind a thick currant bush, her basket, his basket overflowing with plant fruit. You know, I think they're nesting earlier every year. Maria nodded vaguely. She loved the peregrines and she also knew they shouldn't be nesting this early. The tail end of the winter had been eaten by a precocious spring. Following closely would be another impossibly hot summer that would end as summers did now in fits and bursts somewhere in November. The falcon still hunted, the cherry trees still blossomed, but the rhythms of the land were profoundly broken. She turned to face the sun, peeking out between the tower blocks. Halfway up one of those grey buildings, she could easily see their home. The squatted apartments were ringed with the bright green of hanging gardens. We've changed too, she mused. Wiping her brow on her sleeve, she mumbled to her bushes. But will it ever be cold again? She picked a fat black currant and popped it into her mouth, juicy and sweet and not nearly enough to quench her thirst. She lifted her head to look for the peregrine, but the sky was gone, consumed by greasy storm clouds closing in from the east. Sighing, she lifted a heavy basket and as the first splatter of hot rain fell on her face, she stepped onto the path that led back to the tower, to her community and the heat insulated walls of home. Wonderful. Thank you, Kath. Um, I wanted to just pull out a couple lines from your author statement because you say it so beautifully. Um, you talk about how humans are one integrated part of a vast ecological system and how social change, like all change, is messy and uncertain. Um, and so I just, I love um, how you bring us into that complexity and sort of the uncertainty, but the ways that people keep connecting and relating um, in all of your beautifully descriptive writing. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so next I'm very happy to introduce Albert. Um, Albert is an independent scholar from the Netherlands, um, aiming to learn about the world by living in it. Although he is trained as a historian and philosopher, he is mainly engaged in questions of humanity's relationship to the environment, and he has held lectureship positions around the globe. Um, he will be reading from his story, The Green Lizard, which takes place in the southernmost region of India, the Western Ghats. So I'll turn it over to you, Albert. Thanks, Nicole. Yes, after those wonderful readings by Cass and Catherine, I'll try my best to do something. Um, it was a steep walk, and it did not come easy to Ajit, who felt tired, his worries having kept him awake for most of the night. If the harvest would fail again, he would probably have no other choice than to follow the others and move away to the city too. 
Last year's investments had required all of his savings, and the bank wanted its first repayment next month. He should not have gambled like this and felt sorry for his family that he had let himself be drawn so easily into a dream that had not even been his. What did he care about money? Why had he thought he needed a new, a new fridge, let alone a car? His old life had been filled with poverty and toiling work, but at least he had known what he had and his family had been happy. But everybody had been so full of talk about how life would be better and easier if only you replaced the old with the new. He had not understood much of it all, but he had thought if so many people said it was so, then it was probably the right thing to do. So he had cut down the trees and in their stead planted the seeds of plants that had never grown in the soil before. He had disturbed the natural harmony and had brought his family on the verge of ruin. If only the gods would forgive him and, the, and let the rains come. Upon reaching the old tree that looked like a crane, he took a sharp right and followed the well-known path up to the temple. In his life, he had never been up here this early before, and in the darkness, the big trees seemed to tower ever higher around him as symbols of a lost eternity. He touched the largest one of them and bowed his head, feeling tiny and insignificant beside it. Were these the trees about which the man had spoken at yesterday's meeting? He had said they were older than the temple itself and that they were essential for every living, living thing around them. Everything is connected. Of course, Ajit knew that, but he had always seen it as a spiritual connection, not something that could affect existence around him during this life. What role in the system had these trees he had cut down played? How much life had, dis had he disturbed? The man at the meeting had warned that the forest might disappear if they continued this way. Could that really be possible? No, no, of course not, he thought, shaking his head as he quickly stepped on. But as, as he did so in his haste, he kicked down a stone that rolled down the path and crashed into the depths below, awakening a flock of birds, birds whose panicked screeching sounded so ominous that Ajit instinctively bowed deeply. He had become an intruder on his own native soil, continuously disturbing the sacred harmony with every move he made. Feeling a heavy force weighing him down, he dipped his head ever deeper as he moved along, making him resemble the old village humpback, hunchback by the, way, by the time he had made his way to the temple entrance. Carefully removing his slippers, not yet daring to lift his eyes, he climbed up the worn down granite st temple steps. With every step, the rank but sweet smell of incense and yesterday's flowers which had been wedded together by the heat of the night grew stronger and more potent until, upon reaching the top, he felt completely immersed in it, as if he were bathing in a fragrant bath. Slowly he lifted his head again. Despite the darkness, his eyes could clearly make out the familiar coloring on the walls, and he could even see the faint flickering of statues that were perched away in the niches on the, on the other side of the hall. It had been right of him to come here this morning. Steadily regaining confidence, he reached up with his right arm and clanged the bell. The clear sound broke the silence in the temple and in his heart. He took a deep breath, clasped his hands together, and bowed the bow of ages. Feeling the weight of guilt slowly being lifted from his shoulders, he walked towards the golden idols and of the gods, knelt and prayed to them. He was no longer alone. They were with him, and he felt his worries disappear things would work out in the end. He sat there for a while, meditating on man's place in the world, until he noticed that behind him the blackness gradually started to give way. It was time for him to go. Soon his family would wake and he had, a plen and he had plenty of preparations to take care of now that rain would surely come. Moving backwards, he halted underneath the brightly colored portal that arched over the temple entrance. As he had done so, so many times before, he looked up into the yellow eyes of the green lizard that guarded the temple from above. The day's first rays made it look especially vivid, almost alive, and for a second, Ajit saw, he thought he saw it move. He nodded solemnly to the creature, turned his back towards the temple, and walked down the steps, 
and made his way back down to the valley below. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Albert. <laughs> um, so I also just wanted to pull a line from your author statement because I think it sums it up so well. Um, but you talk about how this story aims to humanize individual narratives that are entangled through complex social and economic realities. And I think yours is one of the only stories that sort of explicitly touches on um, those conflicting social and economic realities. So um, I just, I really appreciate uh, that, you know, your willingness to look at um, how we sort of empathetically relate to other people's points of view. <laughs> so excited to talk more in the panel. <laughs> Okay, so lastly, I'm very happy to turn it over to Julia. Um, before beginning her PhD in Oslo, Julia was working in her home country of Mexico at the National Institute of Ecology and Climate Change, where she coordinated research focusing on deforestation, agriculture, and the provision of forest services. And she has carried out field work in Mexico, Peru, and Brazil. And Julia will be reading from her short story, The Visitor. Thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so I'll be reading from my short story, The Visitor, and it's based in the Amazon rainforest, so that explains the background as well. This morning, as I heard your boat approaching the riverbank, I instinctively got scared. The sound of a boat is usually a warning call, an omen of sorrow and despair to our home. As your boat approached, those who could run away into the forest. I, rooted to the spot, stayed attentive and observed, trying to carefully track your movements. I expected the worst, but the white and green hummingbird that likes to visit my flowers every morning told me you were alone and unarmed. While I felt relieved, I still don't know for what reason or purpose you have come. Before you do or say anything, I want to introduce you to our home. You see, you have arrived to a very special place the Amazon rainforest. To a visitor like yourself, our home might seem eerie and daunting. Indeed, when you are not well acquainted with your surroundings, any environment can quickly become uninviting. While the rainforest might seem at first a confusing, labyrinthine chaos, for the trained and attentive mind, it is an order amalgam of life. You might think that the world I am about to show you is fictional. Indeed, it is almost magical. But rest assured, it is as real as the palms of your hands. In the rainforest, I can prove to you that the wonders of the world are not necessarily novelties. There are often hidden jewels in the most familiar, the most ordinary. Nature becomes fantastical when you give yourself the time to explore it. Attention, properly applied to anything, will reveal to you marvels. I know that the guided visit, I hope that the guided visit to our home will trigger in you a firm sense of wonder and humility. As you walk, imagine that you are walking on the greatest cathedral ever. Realize that the rainforest and its trees are offering you monumental, awe-inspiring beauty to which you can claim no authorship. It is a beauty produced by chance and time alone. Consider it is an architectural masterpiece constructed by thousands of years of evolution, far transcending any cathedral that humans have or will ever build. Observe the details of the green dome that is shielding and protecting you from the sun. Gaze at the beams of light that are piercing the verdant ceiling of this green cathedral, illuminating the rich world around you. You are witnessing majesty. You are literally surrounded by it. My name is Manchika but humans call me Shiwawako. I am one of the thickest trees that you will see in the rainforest. While I am not as tall as my brother, the Kopak tree, whose crown can be as high as 60 meters and his, uh, 60 meters and his trunk three meters wide, I am sturdier and heftier. My buttress roots extend as far as four or five meters beyond my trunk. Look up and you will see my crown rising high into the sky. Be careful not to feel dizzy as you try to find my highest branch, more than 30 meters above your head. From the tips of my roots to my highest leaf, I am filled with life. When I was young, I had to fight for survival. I feared being stepped on by a tapir, eaten by a deer, or blighted by a fungus. Growing up, I faced the harsh competition of, uh, I faced the harsh 
competition for sun and light with other trees. I survived not because I was stronger, but because I was luckier. I survived because many others died. Now, as I grow older, fatter, taller, I have realized that my existence, or for that matter, anyone's existence, is just the consequence of fortunate events. I give back what chance and life have given me by hosting other species, helping others thrive. It is my purpose, my responsibility. I accept that one day it will be my time to leave. After all, we are all part of nature and we are made in such a way that we can survive only with the help of other species. Maybe one day, all the diversity and life that my ancestors and I have worked for thousands of years to build and maintain will no longer be, and you will be surrounded by a manufacturing environment. Do you think it is worth destroying the unique and genuine to build something superfluous and artificial? As a species, what empire do you want to create? And in what universe do you want to contemplate and feel mesmerized? If you lose us, what will your heart and soul ponder at when looking for inspirational thoughts or feelings of bewitchment? We are your source of imagination, of creativity. As the stewards of this earth, are you willing to let that go? Look at me again. You can see me as still life, a fragile, inanimate tree defenseless against a powerful and intelligent human as yourself. Or you could recognize that I and the rainforest that I have showed you is not only a source of raw materials, it is also, and most importantly, a complex habitat for thousands of species that feel, learn, and think just like you. You could find in us inspiration, respect, humility, and potential allies. We, all the species of the rainforest, have worked to build an exceptional world filled with transcendental beauty for you to contemplate. We believe that an essential and unique attribute of your species is the capacity to contemplate, to cherish from the simplest rock or mineral to the highest and most powerful tree. It is what makes you human. Of this, I am convinced. Um, thank you, Delia. <laughs> Um, I also love how you um, center a non-human point of view in the story. It's really wonderful to go on that journey with you and um, to have that insight into this rich world of interconnection and reciprocity. Thank you. Okay, so before we move um, into our panel discussion, I'm just going to um, take a moment to just share our last few um, images um, from the anthology by our visual artists and just to acknowledge their work. Um, so I believe we have uh, Tanya on the, on the call with us. Um, Tanya, uh, often looks at the intersection of nature, perception, and science in her work. She's a very prolific interdisciplinary artist, and um, we really loved this image for sort of the, the intersection between light waves and um, the texture of water and shadow. Um, so thank you very much for allowing us to use this image in our anthology, Tanya. Um, this is an image that we paired with Jessica Wilson's story, The Drought, um, and fun fact, it's actually made out of thousands of recycled yogurt pots. <laughs> um, so David Cast recycles um, plastic into alternative canvases and, um, and then creates work about um, uh, the sea um, and its um, and different uh, rising or depleting water lines. <laughs> um, this is an image by Danielle Ubank, and uh, she actually usually works with um, water and she has a, a pretty impressive record, I think, of being the only artist to have painted every ocean on the planet. Um, she's a, a sailor as well, so she travels and creates work. Um, and this was one of our her pew on land pieces that worked really, really well with um, Jude Anderson's story, Cool Burn and the Cherry Ballard. And uh, we have a really early version of 
Um, I believe this is uh, one that Jill Ho Yu, I know her um, from my hometown in Edmonton. I believe this is a really early uh, work of hers, um, but she works uh, in bio art. So she often um, brings together biology and visual art in really, really interesting ways. Um, and she's really interested in the intersection of trauma, embodied memory, and the environment. And this piece accompanied um, Let Us Begin by Sahir Hasneen. And very lastly, um, we have this piece, it's called Nest Four from um, a series by Anne Rose Georgeson. And Anne Rose is based in um, Central Interior, BC. Um, she lives on a farm that is very near um, where she grew up, um, which is, is kind of cool. Um, not too many people still live on the same piece of land uh, that they grew up on. Um, and she is really fascinated with the forest floor and all of the um, natural objects that she finds on um, that piece of land. Um, and we loved the uh, sort of the entanglement that we can find within the nest. And again, another example of just how it's always, <laughs> always around us. So we just wanted to acknowledge all of that amazing work um, from our very talented artists. And um, with that, I'll hand it over to Anne to begin our panel discussion. Thank you everyone for your reading. Hi everyone, I second Nicole um, and everyone else's appreciation for the wonderful um, artwork. I know we have Tuna here and maybe a couple of others as well. I was stunned by the wonderful artworks to accompany such excellent stories. Um, it's good to see everyone in this virtual campfire, as Karen said. And so I'm delighted with Karen and Nicole, my co-editors and Leone, um, to have everyone here. So I thought I'd preface the first question by just quickly noting um, in your very evocative stories and readings how wonderfully in-placed and experiential um, your stories were. I mean, with Kath, you had the presumably fictional town of Irana, with Kess, the Squats, uh, with Albert, the Western Ghats, and with Julia, the Amazon. Um, and so the importance of place and being in place uh, was certainly conveyed. So with this um, in mind, was wanting to pose to all four of you, what was, what do you think uh, your relationship to climate change was with you when you began writing this story? Um, and did writing this story in particular shift your perspective at all? Catherine? I can go. <laughs> wow, you raise your hand and move. Um, uh, so I've been doing a lot of climate change work since 2013. So that's how I combine my um, background in science, art and design. And I, as you know, um, from the introduction um, earlier, I actually did the perfume project first as an art piece. Um, so scent is ephemeral, um, but it's also related to memory. And I think for every single place I've, I've gone to there, there's like a there's a scent or like a series of scents um, per city. I don't know if you you probably um, have a similar idea in terms of like what's the scent of your childhood home, the scent of your favorite hike and things like that. And I was wondering what would happen um, if all of these scents went away. And I was thinking perhaps we might be inspired to conserve them um, if I present them in this like futuristic perfume um, store. And I've exhibited this collection, also multiple um, perfume collections, depending on where I was based. And so I've done um, a set for the Amazon rainforest when I did a residency there for South Korea when I was there and so on and so forth. And um, I, it's, so right now it's actually in um, the Victor Papanek retrospective at the Vitra Design Museum in, um, in Germany. And it's going around um, Europe right now. Um, so I, did this I wrote the story just because I feel like it was interesting to sort of see what the liter literary version of this project might be um, just because I still feel that we still look at the world in terms of stories and while scent can bring out the stories inside us I thought okay maybe this is like a meta way since I was doing the project for a very long time already um, and currently I feel like 
the things I learned um, while writing the story and doing the project has permeated even my work today. So I'm doing a PhD in Sydney right now about petrichor as the scent of wet earth when it rains. So another very evocative smell. So I feel like I'm just gonna bounce around all these olfactory ideas. Um, and also um, critically, I feel like because of the COVID-19 pandemic and we're shut um, inside or when we're covered when we have masks on, like all of these different scents, at least in nature, are even more barricaded from us. So um, I do like how I can recontextualize the works depending on the type of environmental change that we, we have right now. Whoops, sorry, I was muted. I just said thanks, uh, Kath. Um, perhaps if we could go then to Kes. Yeah, I, I love that um, in your work, Kat, with the, the sense and the senses and connection. I think all of that is like, it's so interesting to read about smell. It's like, it's such a interesting connection in my brain somehow. It's, yeah, it's really beautiful. And I think it, um, yeah, it really resonates um, with what I was, yeah, I don't know, writing about as well. I think it's, um, you know, I've been, in terms of answering the question, I guess um, I've been, you know, a community organizer, particularly with like environmental um, protection since the mid nineties. Um, so it's already very, very present for me. Um, in terms of how the, how writing it changed that connection. I think it's interesting because I was living in Brussels. It's a story about Brussels. It was a love letter to a really ugly city that I lived in. And, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult place to feel that land connection. Like it's, you know, one of the like longest places under industrial um, civilization. It's just a big old car park. And, you know, a lot of the story is about the Seine, which is the river buried by Brussels. And yeah, like diving into the, the past of how it used to be a marshland and what that would look like um, into some speculative futures that I was writing about in terms of yeah, organizing and, and climate change and everything else. And I think, yeah, even just that like time imagining or yeah, writing about the, the non-humans who lived there who yeah, were very much in my present because I had a peregrine uh, nest just outside my house and I was watching them very closely and, you know, visiting the Seine um, in the little tiny bits of river that you can find. And I think, yeah, in terms of like senses and connection it, it got me out of the house. It got me to revisit those things because how was I going to tell that story unless I like, you know, knew something more about it, um, which is always, you know, it's always problematic to be writing a story of a non-human. I don't have that experience. I can't possibly, I can't possibly know, but there's something, there's something beautiful in trying. It kind of like put me into a place of, um, yeah, I guess connection is the only word I have for it. Um, and obviously, you know, this is nothing new at all. This is what traditional indigenous communities across the world have been doing since the beginning of time. It's interesting to like, I don't know, find connection in Brussels <laughs> of all places. Um, so yeah, it was very, um, yeah, entangling. Let's say that. I think that's, you know, the word of the day, it, like it, that's how it felt. And yeah, particularly with senses as well. So um, yeah. Yeah, and I think our senses were heightened with you highlighting the sense of sense, so to speak, with both your stories. Thanks very much, Kes. Um, if we could go to Albert and then to Julia. Yeah, well, um, my really this story really profoundly helped me work through some of the questions I had around climate change and especially the, the practical side of, of because everybody theoretically agrees of what to do. But then, um, so I wrote this story after having visited the Western Ghats, which is a prime um, biodiverse rainforest in um, the southwest of India, perched all along the side of the subcontinent. And I went there because uh, at the time I was working on a research project on politics in India. And I spoke to a, a, a politician who was very proud that he had sabotaged and uh, brought a UNESCO environmental project before court. And I thought, well, that's a very strange thing to be proud of, right? That we all have this in mind that UNESCO and, and, and the UN projects are a good thing. 
And, but it turned out that demand was very angry at the fact that if this project would have gone through, that all of the um, native people would have been pushed off their lands and their forest would be declared a, a, a sanctuary just for animals and plants. And I was so intrigued by this that I decided to go there and I talked to a lot of people there. And there were so many different entangled stories there and, and so many different uh, opinions and, and economic interests. And of course, you have the big mining corporations who want to push people out. And then you had big planters who uh, were interested in keeping the people there. So they funded the people to... Um, to speak up against the UN and then you have these um, city dwelling um, academics who come there and who tell the people how they should behave so it was all so intriguing but also so confusing and um, so I tried to work that into the three characters in my story and obviously not every voice was heard in the end but it really helped me to to understand this a bit better and to see how complicated these things are, but also how much potential there is um, through mutual understanding that these people were not that far from each other, but they had dug in into their trenches as deeply and, and really were seeing things through an oppositional lens instead of cooperative. So in one sense, it helped me yeah, see the complexity, but also possibilities. Yeah, thanks. Wonderful. And also the narrative form seems to be particularly amenable to representing some of those multiple perspectives, as, as you mentioned, Albert. Thanks for, very much for that. And Julia, I thought your story was wonderfully highlighting the more than human perspective. Could you also speak to that first question? Yes. Um, uh, thank you for the question. So I, I think, uh, like, as I'm trying to remember what I struggled with while writing the story, uh, I think I, I just saw it as a very nice opportunity to actually share it's like the passion that one can develop when you start to know a place and understand the, its history and how it like what it takes for it actually being there and all the diversity that it has. Um, so I think that that is often misunderstood or not really well portrayed. And the Amazon rainforest, it is a tough environment. It is difficult for humans being uh, there. But there's also so much wonder uh, that can inspire a lot of respect. Uh, so that's something that I that I wanted to share. And I'm trained as a biologist, so I think through the story you you can see that there is. I mean, I try to describe things that I remember when I was walking in the forest and the things that you can suddenly see. Uh, I mean, one wonderful thing of being in nature is so many things are unexpected. So seeing an animal, seeing an interaction is incredibly exciting because you cannot predict when you will see it. It's So it's this element of, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's this unpredictability that really makes it uh, an amazing place. Uh, but I'm also trained as an economist. So I think through the story, I, I mean, I struggle with, so we need resources. We need to transform our nature in order to have a comfortable life. So in the story, I'm also trying to describe Describe. I didn't read fragments uh, related to that, but I'm trying to describe how uh, indigenous populations living in the Amazon have uh, interacted with, uh, with it, their ecosystem and how it has radically changed in the last couple of years um, because they're more connected and they, they are more connected to the uh, more civilized world, uh, although it's not an ideal way to uh, phrase it. Uh, but it's been an interesting, it's an interesting, uh, it's very interesting and important to share their, their stories because it relates to, well, how have other people lived in the past? How are we now managing and interacting with this uh, wonderful ecosystem? Uh, and how should we think about in the future to, to conserve it? Uh, is it still only a source of raw material or uh, do we have some responsibility uh, to conserve it because uh, most of it does not really depend on us and it's uh, yeah and I think as our impact in the not in the earth is uh, I mean our impact in the earth is um, really omnipresent so we really have a lot of responsibility to to decide what yeah to take care of it uh, especially places like the Amazon rainforest. 
Absolutely. And I think that's well conveyed in your story. So stories are lenses, they're mirrors, they're, um, you know, thought experiments, I guess, uh, solution spaces. I was wondering with my co-editors, how did you come up with your concept in your story for approaching quantum reality in your narrative? So what was your way in? And again, we can start, um, think about, about it, ruminate, and then maybe Catherine, if you'd like to go first. Sure. Well, as Karen already mentioned in the chat, research in quantum biology suggests that our sense of smell is a quantum phenomenon. Um, so in my PhD research, not that I'm just going to read it, um, there are two, um, I think the sense of smell is very interesting in the realm of energy humanities in terms of there are two um, theories of how we smell. One is um, the lock and key model. Um, it's tr tradition. If we if we smell something, there are olfactory molecules we breathe it, we breathe in, and then there's an enzyme um, that um, latches onto it, and then it triggers um, the olfactory response. The other more um, uh, controversial but also interesting um, theory is the vibrational theory of scent, where uh, molecules vibrate at a certain energy. Um, and I find it's very compelling and also very interesting. So um, uh, that's one way. I was also thinking about, um, so one of the curators I work with led me to this book. I'm sure a lot of you have read it, Meeting the Universe Halfway by Karen Barad. Um, I'm sure uh, most of you have read it, but I'm halfway through and there was this part um, she, uh, she wrote about, about diffraction. And it got me to thinking, not just about scent, but about the writing of things um, such as climate fiction, um, solar punk, which I find different from writing like normal contemporary fiction in the sense that we are writing to see what the world could be or should be um, considering certain parameters. So I kind of um, think that way, especially since as someone who runs a project called the Apocalypse Project, um, you know, those um, for people who, have, uh, who like watching Black Mirror, um, there was a point when I feel like the very last season, I was so underwhelmed because in the real world, like nothing could possibly compare to what's happening out there. And I feel like um, for writing um, speculative um, fiction, I feel like it's a diffractive practice, but also knowing that the world is changing so much that what you're writing might actually be a reflection of this somewhere in the world. Um, because as William Gibson says, the future is um, uh, is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So, sure. Sorry, just unmuting myself. Thanks, Kat. And Kess, some reflections um, from you about um, your way into your uh, narrative. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was. I was thinking about this question. It's a tough one for me. I think you know, it's. It was really interesting to be writing for something that's obviously like part of like an artistic academic um, project. I was, you know, working class community organizer. I'm very far away from academia. <laughs> like, I'm not going to say as far away as possible, but pretty far. Um, and although, yeah, I'm an author. I definitely don't think of what I do as art or something. All of these things feel like very, yeah, I don't know. Um, different worlds to me or something. So it definitely wasn't coming from that. Um, honestly, it's just really, really specific to the place that I was. And I think that's what I, that's what I often learn um, from, you know, like land connection or like, yeah, learning from um, other ways of living that it is often very specific, like some things are universal and, you know, maybe physics and things like this, but I think often it's just like, it's specifically about the land you're living on. And I think it, like for you to survive on land for tens of thousands of years, you have to be really specific and you have to know those like more than human organisms. And you need to know everything that it's, it's not, this works here and it works everywhere. It's like, it works there. So I think, you know, I was already deep um, in speculative fiction writing because I was like working on my trilogy, which is about, uh, sure, like queer resilience in the apocalypse and everything else. And yeah. I don't know, radicalized sex workers, traumatized trans time travelers, all kinds of things. Uh, so I was already deeply in that world. And it, um, so it kind of seemed natural to like actually connect to the place that it was, which as I say, um, was 
the concrete over the river sun and there's something young it was just very specific to those connections i was finding um and and those organisms and that river and that land and the air and the, the marshlands that i would visit and um so that's it that's the answer <laughs> no, thanks very much i know it is a difficult question that kind of warrants a bit more reflection but no thank you you responded beautifully thanks tess um albert Wonderful. After uh, uh, traumatized time travelers and olfactory uh, quantum mechanics, uh, wonderful answers. Yeah, I, I, I kind of struggled with, with the question too. Um, so in a way, I, I already wrote the story before this, um, this call for, for stories, and I kind of worked my th the, the theory of, of quantum social change into the story a little bit with a little bit of emphasis on, uh, on, on, on entanglement, connectedness, and on the duality with both states at the same time. Um, but when I started to do this, I saw the, the merit of this kind of approach. And it really opened up, at least for me, this kind of uh, new perspective on how we could tell stories and how it's possible to influence. And also this very positive, optimistic kind of storytelling that it's not all just good or, or bad and, and, and not all about apocalypse and um but there there is possibility possibility for change and especially non-linear change so that we can change very quickly in, a, in an optimistic way um, and i think that uh, especially through narrative this can be achieved very well and having heard all these stories having heard everybody speak and having read the stories yeah i think I'm thoroughly convinced of this. Yeah, thanks. Oh, it's good to know that by the end of it, you kind of shifted in, um, uh, succeeded in shifting your own perspective, so to speak. Thanks very much, um, Albert. Um, and Julia, over to you. Yes. Um, so I, I think my story in, in that for that question, it's particularly easy because it's really, it's a conversation between two completely different life forms. It's a tree. Uh, and I imagine myself, I really, I mean, the visitor who's the one who's having this uh, visit to the Amazon. Uh, I don't never really define it, but I imagine it just being a, either a young boy or a young adult um, and just happening to arrive to the rainforest and trying to discover this place. And how the tree is presenting uh, both his surrounding um, and his own life, uh, it's it's almost like a grandfather to uh, uh, children uh, relation. Uh, so the, the tree is expressing his emotions. I mean, I'm using here his uh, 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 yeah, uh, voluntarily, but uh, so the tree is expressing his emotions, uh, his life story, and sort of like his philosophy of life at the end, which can be very much uh, related to a human experience. Um, so I think that's the way I try to, to relate and also, I mean, showing the, the interconnected, how interconnected we all are, not, I mean, in the rainforest, but also at the larger scale. So there's one point where uh, the, how rain, uh, rainfall changing patterns in rainfall are affecting, eventually can affect agricultural productivity, um, uh, or threaten the Amazon itself, right? And then this can have repercussions in European climate, uh, soil productivity, uh, fresh, wa um, uh, fresh water life. Um, so I think I think that's the main uh, way that I that I try to to describe it. And uh, the tree, I mean, the the, the narrator, it, it's a tree, and this is this one one tree that I actually saw during my PhD field work. Um, and I think that inspired the whole thing. One of the things that I struggle is sort of uh, how to make this a nice story and not uh, doomsday, doomsday, yeah, more like the standard stories where we, it's sort of like humans against nature, but more, yeah, the quantum comes with like humans with nature. 
Thanks very much, Julia. We're also interested in hearing about what you were currently working on, if you had other writing projects. I know, um, Kath, your big writing project's probably the big T, but, you know, I'm sure you've got other, <laughs> other you know, things that you're working on as well. But if I could um, preface that also by referring to um, a question um, by one of our valued audience members in chat, because I think it was beautifully put, um, just to encourage others also to please post any questions. They might be interested in hearing um, the author's answer. And, and she's written question to the beautiful authors, how do you seduce people to halt, listen, ponder, and imagine a set of different futures. So I thought that was lovely, lyrically put. And so I would invite you to speak to that as well as um, work in, if you're writing, working on other writing projects. And again, we might do the round robin again. Um, perhaps, Kath, you'd like to go? Sure. Um, so I like drawing people in, in terms of really setting a very rich sensory scene. Um, this is also the way I draw people to my own art projects because I feel like there's a common humanity to everyone, no matter what um, we believe in. And the idea for me is to, to reel them in, right? Like a fish. Um, so uh, I, I try not to um, be political or like be very didactic, like you have to believe this more, but just like really, if I'm sitting in a on the beach, like what do I see? And I write that down. So it becomes something very relatable to people and just ha adding a touch of magic, like cats eating spider webs and things like that. Um, so yeah, and other writing projects, I'm actually writing like more of these old factory stories. I feel like they really um, sustain me um, in terms of, I mean, in parallel to my PhD writing, just because I don't have to cite anything. <laughs> Um, so it's great. It's like, just like let it all out. Um, I also, so I'm doing a practice-based PhD. So a lot of it has um, a lot of olfactory intersections. Um, for example, because of the Australian bushfire crisis, um, I'm, make, I'm casting the ashes of the bushfires into hearts, kind of like this one. So I'm making like a hundred of those. And I feel like when I make something, they almost look like a prop for a story in my head. And I feel like I should write something that I can turn into a book while I exhibit this. So, um, yeah. Wonderful. And I've seen some of those hearts in person. So it was great to see. Um, thanks, Kath. And uh, Kes? Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I enjoy most about writing, um, it's almost maybe it's a little quantum I'm not quite sure what that means um but I think you know when you're when you read something and someone describes something and it, it like affects somebody's body on the other side of the world for example or like through time you know it was written 30 years ago and you read it and you're like you find yourself crying you're like wow like somebody who just wrote something far away 30 years ago is making me cry and like their body is affecting my body and like how does you know I think those things can be so there's something so compelling about it and I you know I often have like I don't know messages from people who are just kind of like yeah like I couldn't stop laughing at this scene and like oh that's what I wanted and wow like how did I how did that happen like I wrote something like five years ago and then you're laughing there it's just like how does that you know there's something so there's something so beautiful about those yeah connections through time and space that um that something like writing can can create I guess and also in a more literal way like I you know I run um a class called writing from the margins and I do a lot of workshops like encouraging people literally to be thinking about um, speculative fiction, particularly when it comes to like organizing activism um, and particularly for people with uh, marginalized experiences because I think so much activism, social change and things is often led by like big thought leaders who are usually like middle class or um, otherwise privileged. And so many people's stories aren't included in that. And so many people who have like a much more direct experience of oppression or anti-oppression or resistance aren't included. Um, so that's, you know, really interesting to yeah, have people with um, yeah, silenced voices uh, write their own stories and to like see what comes out of that can be so powerful. So, um, and what was the other question? Oh, I'm working on, so last year uh, under lockdown, I finished uh, my trilogy, which was a fun time to be writing a book about 
queer resilience in the apocalypse, to be honest. Um, and I am working on a novella which has no humans in it, um, which is fun. <laughs> um, I have some big dreams of like, yeah, something um, language thingy, but I'm not quite sure what it is yet. But for sure, the novella is coming soon and it has no humans in it. And I'm working on a queer ecology series. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. relating like more than human That's nature. That's wonderful. I think it's queer. precisely these times when we need these uh, hopeful narratives, you know, during the pandemic and during uh, the climate crisis. So that's wonderful. Thanks very much, Kes. Um, Albert, if we could uh, hand it over to you. Yeah, well, great question. How to seduce people to, um, to imagine a different future. Um, well, I think for me personally, when, when writing stories, um, I like to um, paint a real kind of realist picture, but then slightly magical, just so slightly magical realism. So to get people have it relatable, accessible to many people to get a big audience, because this is the the power of fiction, I, I think, because many people who wouldn't read academic papers, the International Panel on Climate Change kind of things, but they still need a way of convincing and showing a different future. Um, so for me, by these kind of magical realist stories, you can have people follow along and then surprise them in the end and also have them imagine about things that might be more than just what is there and then just the material. Um, so this relatability, um, yeah, I think I would say that. And then on what I'm working on now is um, during the COVID pandemic, I half a year, I uh, lived in Turkey and I wrote my first novel, which is almost finished now. And now this last half year, I've been locking myself up and reading all the books I still wanted to read. Uh, so I'm a big Wikipedia now somewhere here with, uh, so it's really time to leave again and to finish my book as well. But that's what I'm working on now. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Thanks, um, Alfred and Julia. Yeah, it, for the first question, it, so I think also related to my personal experience, I, I think just the power of shared experiences or giving people relevant experience where they can feel excited and in awe and amazed that I think that's the most important to actually engage people that because that's the hardest part. Uh, yeah, I, and it's easier when you're a child. So I think early experiences where you're exposed to different environments, different cultures, different context and you learn to appreciate that is it's very important because it's much more difficult when you have adults I think like changing like a full grown adult and convincing him that saving the Amazon is super important I think it's going to be harder than maybe someone who's younger and had the value to appreciate it when they were young I don't know uh, as for writing projects right now uh, I'm finishing my PhD PhD, so I, I, that's the only writing that I'm trying to focus right now, unfortunately. Uh, no, well, yeah. So hopefully in the future there'll be more fiction writing. What a wonderful example, both of you, both Kath and Julia, uh, doing PhDs and doing these creative projects as well. I think you inspire us all, as do Kess and Albert. So thanks very much um, to our authors. I'm going to hand back to Nicole now. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, so we just wanted to open it up briefly for audience questions. And then if we have time, we'll just do a, a very quick um, guided writing exercise. Or if we run out of time, I can tell you what it is and you can do it um, afterwards. Um, but I just wanted to open it up to see if there's any questions from the audience um, that anyone would like to, to ask. Maybe I'll give it a minute. Um, so the, um, oh, I see Karen, Karen's got a hand. Yeah, I was just wondering what, um, you know, in venturing into these like quantum social change um, things, like what type of reactions did you get from friends and family um, regarding your stories? Um, as the visitor or the, yeah. How have, has your, have you re received a lot of positive support and shared them or um, do people just think like, oh, this is a little strange? 
if anyone can answer that. <laughs> I mean, Albert, you go, could your hands first? Yeah, all right. And um, well, some of my uh, my friends who are physicists, they were kind of skeptical about the whole uh, quantum element. And um, it taught me a lot about quantum mechanics, speaking to them, uh, trying to explain this. But I think in the end, they were really positively engaged with the whole thing. Um, and other than that, yeah, great support, uh, wonderful reactions, people really feeling that through stories like these, um, things can change. Yeah. Um, I have a similar experience. So I know um, a quantum physicist. So of course I sent him this, right? And then the Karen Barrett book, and he, he like, he doesn't really have time to, to read it, uh, but he will read my story. So I think it's more of just like, just a little bit at a time. Um, and sometimes I think, cause I'm an artist who works with a lot of scientists and I feel like there's a lot that science gives me, but I'm still wondering, it, it's, it's more this um, flow of the wave instead of um, artists giving something to scientists in an equal way, aside from, uh, aside from you know, artists entertaining scientists. So I think um, that's like one opportunity in the future, like how to get scientists to sort of see what's the impact of science beyond the lab, right? Um, they work so hard and really work long hours and it's just hard to, to get them to do it. But I think for me, um, because there's such joy in writing, um, I feel like, you know what, if, if this is the challenge, um, bring it on, right? Let's just like keep writing and keep having fun. They're all like tired in the lab and just like keep like one day. Um, I feel like that's, uh, we might be able to get them to see like the relevance of quantum physics in the social sciences. I can, I can briefly comment on that. I, I think the people that have shared it, I mean, I've shared it on social networks, uh, but friends and family that I've shared it with, I think most of them know me and most of them share some in similar interests. So in that sense, I think it's also just uh, like a, an additional way to relate to their own experiences or to understand uh, my own interests as well. So it is something that I wonder if someone who is not interested in environmental issues, how would they take my story? Would they even care to read it? Uh, I think it, 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 it's difficult to say in that case or to incentivize someone to really engage in it. Yeah, Julia, that makes sense. Um, the way that people relate to it um, according to their own experiences, I think some of the I don't know, the most moving feedback I get is when people are like, oh, like I read about, I don't know, this nice story about a um, kingfisher. And then I went out and watched the pigeon on my balcony and just looked at it in a different way and connected in a different way or like saw the city through different eyes or something. And there's something, I mean, that's all I could hope for. That's the work, right? That's that's beautiful. Um, so yeah, I love to hear those things. And like, it doesn't even have to be the same city or the same species for people just be like, yeah, like I don't really think about non-humans. They're just kind of there in the background while I just go around my busy city life. And then someone was like, oh, I was just like hanging out with the pigeon today. And it was really nice. I was like, yeah, I do that a lot. It's really nice. <laughs> Thank you all for those answers. Um, I just see a question in the chat from Alexa. Um, she was wondering um, or curious to hear your thoughts on um, what we can do to get the general public more interested in the future, if, if anyone has any ideas about that. Um, Oh, I see Tanya also has a question. <laughs> um, maybe we'll answer that one first and then I'll, I'll bring it over to you, Tanya. Tanya? Um, I can try to answer this. Um, in a way, it's also related to Alexa's initial question about how art affects my writing. Um, I kind of see this as how to get people to care about something that might not um, be relevant to them in that particular space and time. Um, so I try to make things very relatable. I think the topics of climate change I find very unwieldy and also um, really dry and it's been pirated 
upon for years already and i feel like it's, i don't know if i'm being a pessimist but the world you know hasn't gone that much better um and we have um this pandemic situation going on right now so i think um if we make it relatable and try to make it a hopeful way that people want to participate in it um i think it's also why i like exhibiting the scents because you get to smell the scents and that's a physical action for you to remember things and also i think as an artist and a writer i feel like i don't really think that what I will do will fix everything right now. And maybe that's also a very quantum way of thinking about it. I feel like what every, the bulk of my work as an artist and writer and academic is just like a drop. Um, and the best I can hope for is to nudge it in the right direction together with everyone else who's trying to work for a better world. So. Yeah, I love that you mentioned like relatability and like I think access as well I think it's a really big part of it um you know I think it's also I think it's a tricky question because like privilege and access is a thing and so like if you're working all day in the supermarket to house your kids who's thinking about the future right who's thinking about climate change if you're a nurse dealing with COVID patients all day long or driving a fucking bus like there's there isn't space for so many people and so I think like making these stories accessible um even when it's like already not academic but also like who has time to read a book um or like how does that relate to you know just surviving i mean so many people are just surviving um so many people in my community as well so i think it's you know it's it's something i struggle with a lot and you know i definitely am proud to be writing trashy fiction um because you know when you get a day off you just want to read something trashy on the beach right or um on the balcony or something so yeah I think access is a really important part of it for me and that's one of the things that I loved about this project is kind of like yeah people don't get to read IPCC reports but like fiction is is more accessible to more people or some people um and then within that there's also like a whole world of like yeah what people can relate to um and what what speaks people's language when they're so busy and just surviving and don't have time to think about the present much less the future Right on. Thank you so much for that. And I think that might speak to um, the, uh, to Vitalji's question in the chat um, a little bit about um, accessibility. Um, I'm just sort of wrapping it up a little bit just because we're down to seven minutes. So <laughs> I want to just uh, quickly ask Tona um, about her question and then um, and then turn it back over to Karen pretty quickly after that. Um, Tona. Well, it's not really a question. It's more a comment, I guess. But I'm sitting here making drawings for a book uh, by Martin Sheffer. I don't know if you know his um, his work, but um, he made a book uh, called Happy Science. But now he's, he has changed the title to Thinking What Nobody Thought. Best Kept Secrets of Happy Science. <laughs> and I feel that this is a little bit related to this because He's writing about um, creativity and science and also how to communicate complex things also sometimes in simple ways and in playful ways. So um, he wrote an article uh, in 2014 where I was one of the co-writers and I also made this drawing about it was called dual thinking for scientists. So it's a very like a creative, free and intuitive way of working. Uh, and then you have the production or, or the, where you make the actual results. So it's like an eternity symbol and both sides are, are equally important. I'm a lot on, on this, <laughs> in this kind of state all the time, but then, um, so while I'm, I'm listening to you because he wants, now he has written a whole book about this topic and he wants drawings all through the book. So while I'm talking to you, I'm making these kind of, you know, like sketches. This is like, a, um, this was just something I made now, but it's elephants and then you have this time, you know, in the middle and things like that and insects and this and that. But so Martin is a, a biologist uh, or like an ecologist and mathematical biologist. 
so, uh, and working with critical transitions. So he's in this very serious, like he's trying mathematically to, to predict sudden changes in complex systems. Um, but then he also has this very playful attitude, both to how he's um, expressing or how, for example, when he has talks, he often uh, brings uh, instruments on stage. Um, we also make some like video performances together. We've been working together since 2011. So there are so many ways of combining art and science and also to, um, to express things like you have done in this book, but there are so many possibilities. So I, I'm very excited and I'm, um, yeah, I'm happy to also be, have a little part of this <laughs> project. <laughs> Uh, We're very happy to have you on it as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and I think you're right. I think, um, you know, the more ways that we can find to bring people in, like whether through art or through embodiment, it's, yeah, all of this is such, um, just creates so much um, creativity for us to access these complex questions. Um, so I want to just in our last three minutes, just to turn it back over to, to Karen, I think, um, to conclude our session for today. Um, thank you all so much. You've been amazing. <laughs> I wish we could have a lot more time to dive into these questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It really feels like the start of a conversation <laughs> rather than, you know, like you can't really do this in a webinar. And what's been wonderful about these two webinars is to actually meet face to <laughs> like screen to screen um, and have a discussion about this because you know, I think this was probably one of the most rewarding project research projects that I've ever done. And in some of it goes to what Tony was saying, just being a little playful and putting something out there and not knowing, you know, that you can't say like, and then we will do this and we will have this. And, and I think that, um, you know, going to what Kath was saying about um, Karen Barad's work, you know, agential realism and participatory realism and the fact that we are actually like, constantly interacting. And I think all your stories show that so well that, that we actually have a, a role to play. And I just finished my book on quantum social change called You Matter More Than You Think. And I think that, you know, it really is that you you all matter more than you think. We all do. And, um, and everybody has that possibility, you know, whether they're working in a grocery store, whether they're, you know, in every conversation. And quantum social science really shows that we are entangled through language, through meaning making, and it is through every single conversation that we have. And, you know, I think sometimes for myself, I think like, oh, how do we connect with people who don't see the world? And and what we really know is that we are connected. And it is like just taking that moment to sit on the porch and watch a pigeon or to you know look in the eyes of a green lizard or think what it's like to be that tree and everything. So I, I feel like um, what I'm left with here is that, wow, we need to do volume two. <laughs> and we need to really get people to be thinking and creating our own stories about the future that we want and engage people with really starting to see that it's not just out there in the future, it's right here, right now that we matter. So, so yeah, so I just, you know, at the, just to close, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story, sharing your time, sharing your artwork, sharing your, your questions and joining us for these um, webinars. And um, we will continue the conversation um, with all of you. So thank you so much. And thank you. Um, Nicole and Anne and Leonie for organizing this.